Ready? Hi, it's true. I am Andy Barrows. And this beautiful thing is my brand new book, The Truth According to Us. Now, the first thing you need to know about this book is that it is set in 1938 in the small town of Macedonia, West Virginia. And what happens right about when I say that is that the first question I get is, why West Virginia? Unless you're my editor. And then the first question was, why, why West Virginia? And the answer is that for me, West Virginia is the land of mystery and drama and enchantment. Um, I know that's not how most people think of West Virginia, but that's how it is for me because a big, important branch of my family is from West Virginia. And this branch of the family, my, my mother's side of the family, this is the side that talks all the time. And they talk, most importantly, they talk in stories. Everybody in, on that side of the family talks, and they tell story after story after story. And this is how I grew up. This was the wallpaper of my life. In my household, you hear a story about everything. You never get a simple answer to a simple question. And you cannot find out a fact to save your life. And you know, to give, I was thinking about various examples I could give of this. They're endless. The examples are endless. Um, but there was one that occurred to me the other day. About one day, I, I walked into the kitchen. And my mom and Mary Ann, my Aunt Mary Ann Schaefer, were sitting in the kitchen. And I said, very straightforwardly, very simply, I said, can I have a banana? This is what I got. Doesn't she remind you of Mama? <laughs> she does. Mama loved bananas. Yes. Do you, do you remember the time when Mama was sick and Dickie Ruark sent her a bunch of bananas? Oh, he was such a nice man. He was, even though he was a bootlegger. At this point, my ears perk up, and I start yelling, you knew a bootlegger? How did you know he was a bootlegger? How did you know him? And my mother answers, oh, we knew he was a bootlegger because he had pockets on the inside of his coat. But he was such a nice man. What was his wife's name? Mm, I don't remember. He divorced her. He did, and he wouldn't tell anybody why. He said if they wanted to know why, they should send him $5, and he'd write it out for them. He was such a nice man. <laughs> then they got up and left. You notice... I don't have a banana here at all. Um, and this was, th that Dickie Ruark and his pocket full of bananas, this, that's just one tiny instance. But to me, that, just, that is one more example of how exciting and wonderful and dramatic life was in the town of Martinsburg, West Virginia, where my mom and Mary Ann grew up. And, and, and the, the wonders of this town filled my childhood. In this town, the gypsies burnt down the funeral parlor. In this town, my mother got poison oak inside her nose. <laughs> In that town, Mary Ann went on her first date with a boy who had seven older sisters who had tried to bury him alive when he was five years old. The wonders were endless. Now, despite the fact that I had to grow up in boring old California instead of Martinsburg, West Virginia. I did manage to grow up and everything was fine. And what I um, decided to do was become an editor. And I was an editor for many years um, until I figured out that writers were having a lot more fun than editors. And I decided I would become a writer. And in order to do that, I went and got myself an MFA in creative writing. Now, when you get an MFA, the ostensible uh, purpose for getting one of those is that you become a better writer. Who knows if that happens? But one of the, the, the among the lessons that you encounter in a MFA program, it's pretty much standard operating procedure for you to be taught 
how to be a writer, what a writer is. And in my program, as in I think a lot of programs, the idea of the writer that I was given was that of a, of a distinctly individual voice. The voice is mine and mine alone, and that the, the treasure of a writer, the source of the writer's creation is his or her own experiences refracted through the, the, the prism of the, you know, that, that personal sensibility. The individuality was a paramount idea in being a writer. And in addition to this idea about being a writer and being this individual, the preciousness of individuality, another piece of information that was sort of dispensed as part of the program was the idea that the most American story that it is possible to write is the story about the hero who leaves Ma and Pa and the family behind and travels into the great wilds of America. It is generally a guy who does this, but it could be a girl. Travels into the wild wilds of America and then kills something or other while he's there, like bad animals or bad guys or something like that. And then at that point is thus free to become entirely self-determined and this great individual um, free acting independent being. That was, it was told to me, it was, it, was, it was taught to me that that was the most American theme of, of American themes, that that, that that was the great American novel's theme. I thought that was very weird. So I avoided the whole topic of the great American novel by becoming a children's book author, which was great because I love children and I do think that seven year old olds or have reached the pinnacle of life and that everything that happens afterwards is down, goes downhill. Um, so that was wonderful. I love children and I loved writing for them and I really liked going out and talking to them and that was perfect. That was my career and that was, I intended to remain a children's book writer. That was what I was doing and I was enjoying it and then all of a sudden everything changed and it changed in about the middle of 2006. Because in the middle of 2006, my Aunt Marianne Schaefer, who was not just sitting in the kitchen talking about Dickie Ruark and bananas, but was also all this time writing stories, finally had a book accepted for publication. This was a book that she had been writing for many years. Um, it was called the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. And it was accepted for publication and she was so thrilled because it was her lifelong dream. All she had ever wanted was to write a book that somebody would like enough to publish. And it was the fulfillment of all of our dreams too because we had wanted Marianne to write a book for years and she had never finished a book before. And now the whole world was gonna see that she was just the most genius of all possible storytellers. She was Scheherazade. And so we were all busting with pride and everything was fabulous, except that very soon after the book was accepted for publication, Marianne fell ill. And a few months later, when the editor came back to her with fairly substantial rewrites, Marianne didn't feel that she was well enough to begin writing again. And at that point, she called me up and said, you know, you're the other writer in the family, can you finish this book for me? And I said, of course I can. Don't worry about a thing, I'll take care of it. And inside, I was thinking, this is, this is gonna be impossible. This is crazy. I have been taught that the author's voice is the in, is individual, is the, the, oh, the precious, singular voice is what an author creates. That's how you know you're an author. How am I going to be Marianne's voice? How am I going to tell Marianne's story? And additionally, how am I ever going to know enough about the occupation of the Channel Islands to write a book about it? So, well, first tactic, procrastination. Um, but that didn't work for very long. Um, I had to sit down and begin. And when I sat down the very first day, it is very clear recollection 
of that day, I sat down and I started working away and I was writing. And after a couple hours, I thought, oh, this is not going to be impossible. This is going to be wonderful. Because I grew up hearing Marianne tell stories. Her stories were what made my idea of story. I knew how she would craft a sentence. I knew how she would tell an episode. It, I could read a sentence and I'd think, oh, I know what comes next, because she had created my idea of what stories were. And as I worked, I became more and more fascinated with, first of all, getting rid of this concept of the artist as a solo creature, and second, getting rid of the idea that the American story involves leaving your past behind, because it seems to me that there's an enormously important American story that has to do with bringing your past with you. So that was a very important transition for me, and that was very interesting. And I loved working on the book because I was in, having a conversation with my Aunt Marianne, who was the most entertaining human being I have ever or will ever meet. And the book was a wonderful book. And Marianne did not live to see that book get published. She died five months before Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society came out, so she did not get to see the book that she wrote become a major international bestseller. She did not get to see that that book was published in, what is it, 35 countries now and 28 languages. And that drives me completely crazy. I really, I, it's, that to me is completely tragic. And as much, you know, I know, sure, she's watching from on high and enjoying the reception that the book got and how much people love that book, but I would really much prefer it if she were right, you know, right here or here would be even better talking to people about the book and seeing how much people loved it, that would be wonderful. After the book came out, the book came out in July of 2008, and about a few months later in November of 2008, my, my mom and I and my cousins, Marianne's daughters, my first cousins, we took a pilgrimage. We took a pilgrimage back to the source of it all, Martinsburg, West Virginia. And this, we live in California, so this was this pilgrimage involved us flying across the country, and then we got in our little rental car and we chugged over a bunch of mountains, and we got finally to the source of everything, the holy city, the place where it all happened, where Dickie Ruark and his bananas trod the ground. We got there, we got to Martinsburg, West Virginia, and I stood there in the town square and I looked around, and bleak is a word that comes to mind. My mother says it's rude to call it barren. Now, every single one of you has been in a town like Martinsburg. I mean, it's, a, it's an old town. It's got a few nice old buildings. It's got a lot of not so nice old buildings. It's got a lot of empty storefronts. Got a few strip malls. Nothing much is happening. Sort of empty, sort of nothing. Bleak. But I was walking around this town with my mom. And we'd be walking, we'd be sort of trudging along, and I'd be looking at some splintery old building. And she would say, there's the funeral parlor. The gypsies burnt down. Oh, look, there's the house we lived in when I persuaded Mary Ann that she needed to learn how to jump into her clothes and she jumped off the side of the bed and knocked herself out on the floor. Oh, look, that's where the traveling preacher used to come and walk on water every summer until my uncles took the board out from under the water and he drowned. And, oh, look, that's where I hung Marianne out the window by her ankles so we could hide the hairbrush so my mother couldn't hit us. And I realized that the stories made Martinsburg exactly what I had anticipated, that they transformed bleak into the center of the world. Actually, Martinsburg, West Virginia, is the center of the world. It is the most exciting and dramatic and mysterious and enchanting place on Earth. The idea being that stories make a reality that's just as 
true as bleak. And at that point, I had this enormous like, explosion in my head, and I thought, that's it. Truth has to do with the stories you tell. And I thought to myself, that's the book I want to write. So that's the book I wrote. So oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. What I'd like to do now is read to you a little bit from this fine book that I wrote. I'm going to get this microphone up here. Maybe. I can do it without that. I can do it like this. I'm going to read to you from the um, opening page, the first two paragraphs of this fine book. Um, the speaker in this case is Willa Romaine. She's 12 years old. In 1938, the year I was 12, my hometown of Macedonia, West Virginia, celebrated its sesquicentennial, a word I thought had to do with fruit for the longest time. In school, we commemorated the occasion, as we commemorated most occasions, with tableau, one for each of the major events of Macedonia's history. There weren't many, hardly enough to stretch out across eight grades, but the teachers eked them out the best they could. If it hadn't been for the war between the states, I don't know what they would have done. When Virginia seceded from the Union, Western Virginia got mad and seceded right back into it, all except for four little counties, one of them ours, that stuck out their tongues at West Virginia and declared themselves part of the Confederacy, a piece of sass with long consequences in the way of road paving and school desks. Tucked up in a crook between the Potomac and the Shenandoah, Macedonia was a junction for generals and railroads alike. And by the time Lee hung up his sword at Appomattox, the town had changed hands 47 times, six of them in one day. Our teachers dearly loved to get up a scene of the townspeople stuffing their Confederate flags up the chimney as the Union troops marched in and then yanking them back out again as the troops departed. The fourth, fifth, and sixth graders got the war scenes, and the seventh and eighth graders got the short end of the stick because not a thing happened in Macedonia after 1865 except for the roundhouse blowing up and the American Everlasting Hosiery Company opening its doors. Half the town worked in that company, and the other half wished it did, but there was not much about the American Everlasting Hosiery Company that looked good in a tableau. Sometimes the teachers gave up and killed two birds with one stone by making the seventh graders march across the stage waving socks while the eighth graders sang the Star Spangled Banner behind them. In 1938, though, the eighth grade hit pay dirt because Mrs. Roosevelt drove through town. She stopped at the town square, took a drink from our sulfur spring water fountain, made a face, and drove away. That was plenty for a tableau, except that the eighth grade, Ms. instead of making a face, the eighth grade Mrs. Roosevelt said, the people of Macedonia are lucky to receive the benefits of healthful mineral water. My sister Bird and I laughed so hard we got sent out into the hall. Now I'd like to read one more bit, which is from one of our other major characters, Miss Leila Beck. Miss Leila Beck is a senator's daughter, a debutante from Washington, D.C. She has led a life of privilege and luxury and through a series of events, essentially refusing to marry the man her father wanted her to marry, she's gotten kicked out of her parents' house and forced to the great horror of taking a job. The only job that she has available to her is a job that's offered to her by her uncle who works for the Federal Writers Project. He's offered her the job of going to the town of Macedonia, West Virginia to write their history for their sesquicentennial. This is about the worst moment of her life. May 27th, 1938, dear Ben, that's her uncle, let's pause for a moment and discuss this calmly, just the two of us, without father's lash of fire cracking over our heads. Now, Ben, I don't know what father's got on you, 
but it must be something pretty awful to bring you to the point of hiring me, and for the WPA, too. Have you killed someone? Even if you have, there must be a better way to expiate your crimes than by putting me on the writer's project, which is practically a crime in itself. I certainly understand that if father is twisting your arm, you have to give me some kind of job. I understand and I sympathize, but consider. Father will be perfectly satisfied if you put me in a dainty little secretarial position in your office, and so will I. Simply by offering me a temporary place as your secretary, you will meet father's requirements, and your arm will be your own again. There is no need to go to extremes. I refer to West Virginia. Sending me to West Virginia is extreme, not to mention ostentatious toadying, and mean. Yesterday afternoon, after I had got over my first shock at your letter, I betook myself to the library to read up on the writer's project. You see, I do know where the library is. And I discovered that your arguments in favor of West Virginia, state flower, the rhododendron, are completely erroneous. Yes, I was born in Washington, D.C., but it's completely ridiculous to say that I'm obliged to work in the state closest to my birthplace. You made that up. I know you did. You know what the motto of West Virginia is? It's Montani Semper Liberi. Mountaineers are always free. Need I say more? Do you and Father think that by packing me off to the mountain state, you'll turn me into a fresh-faced, wholesome girl in ankle socks bounding over the rocky heights? You're mad. You'll drive me to drink. And in West Virginia, the drink is probably moonshine, which will rot my entrails and make me blind. Not only will I be miserable, I'll be terrible. I'll be the worst researcher in the history of the project, and that includes the 70-year-old Stalinist morphine addict you told me about. Can you picture me interviewing farmers' wives and coal miners, asking tactful questions about head lice and baths? Can counting pigs and dogs and babies. Then they'll shoot me, and I won't blame them if they do. Please reconsider. You're my uncle. You're supposed to dote on me, and I'm supposed to be the sunshine of your lonely bachelorhood. Perhaps I haven't lived up to my end recently, but give me a chance. Indulge me one last time, and take me off the West Virginia project and give me a job in your office and I swear to you that I will be the best secretary you ever saw. I will arrive in your office at eight in the morning. I will type my fingers to the bone. I will be lovely on the telephone. I will contemplate serious topics. I'll be a credit to you. Just don't send me to West Virginia, please. Your loving and usually obedient niece, Layla. May 28th. Layla, do you realize that nearly one quarter of the employable citizens of this country are out of work? Do you realize that I receive dozens of letters each week from diligent, well-educated men and women imploring me for a job, any job on the project? These people are desperate, Layla. They've been unemployed for so long they've forgotten what it's like to work. They've sold everything they own for pennies. They go to bed hungry inside if they're lucky, outside if they're not, and they wake up hungry. They've been wearing the same suit of clothes for years, sponged off each night because if they scrub it on a washboard, the cloth will shred to rags. Their children are sick because they don't get enough to eat and they're dirty because they have no place to wash. These are people who never thought they'd have to beg, and yet here they are begging me for a job that won't pay them enough to keep food in their stomachs. There is an opening on the West Virginia Writers Project. I have, against my better judgment, given you that position. Be grateful or be damned. Ben. That's where we're going to stop with that. But now... It's time for you to ask me questions, if you have any. And they can be about anything. They can be about the truth according to us. They can be about Guernsey. They can even be about Ivy and Bean. You can ask me about math, but I wouldn't advise it.
Yes, ma'am. Okay, I love the Guernsey Literary Club that I wrote about. And I recommend it to people all the time, but that title is a freaking awful. Oh, I know it. Isn't it terrible? I can't believe that. So what was the motivation behind this mouthful of title? Okay, what is the motivation behind the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society? I thought they'd change it. <laughs> Mary Ann called it that because she couldn't think of anything else, and I called it that because Mary Ann called it that, and I thought for sure they'd change it. I kept waiting for them to change it, and then eventually I called the editor and said, you know, that's not gonna be the real title, of course, and she said, Oh, no, I think it's great. Yeah, it's great. She didn't have to go all over the country saying it. <laughs> and nobody, I mean, there are, I would say, in the years since that book has been published, among the six million people who have read that book, I would say there's about 12 who have said the title correctly in that time. <laughs> and, you know, even there was, the publisher uh, bought some advertising on NPR, even NPR didn't get it right. They dropped the pie. Um, we, got, we got an eighth of our money back because it was one eighth of the words that they left off, but, but which, that was very unsatisfying. Um, no, I, I have no idea why they called it that. It, it, it was, it's a, such a mouthful, but I will say that if, when people walk into a bookstore and say, I want that potato book, they actually end up with the book they want. It's the most amazing thing. I was thinking they'd end up with cookbooks, and they don't. They end up with that potato book, and they get, or th that book about that island and the potatoes. They get the one they want. So it works in a, in a fashion. If you could retitle it, what would you call it? Ooh, nobody's ever asked me that question before. The thrill of power runs through my veins. <laughs> Uh, something along the lines of something about books saving your life, but it would have to be in some sort of circuitous way. I don't know. I'd have to think about that for a good long time. T titles are tough. They might give it away, though. Yes. It's a, kind of a surprise with regards to You liked that? That, that? that you don't know what... It's sort of curious. Some people find it curious. I couldn't figure out what, what kind of society would deal with potato peels. Right? Yeah. But that didn't make you want to throw the book across the room? No. You wanted to find out. That's good. So... Sometimes it works, that potato book. Yes, ma'am. Um, what, made, what made your aunt and, and you look at it from a correspondence perspective? Huh, why the letters? Okay, I asked Marianne this question once, and Marianne's answer was, I thought it would be easier, which I think is hilarious. Um, because most people don't consider writing an epistolary novel a particularly easy form. The, the great practitioner of it died in about 1789. Um, but I know she loved books of letters. I mean, I think that's wise, because she loved reading books of letters. I mean, I remember when I was about nine years old, she gave me the book Daddy Longlegs and told me not to come back to her house until I had finished reading it. That's a great novel written all in letters. Um, and I also think it was a brilliant choice, because in that book, in, in the Guern, Guernsey Literary book, we are talking about historical events, and it would have been ridiculous to have a, just a few characters having all of those experiences. But the amount of energy you get from 26 different first-person voices carries you over the information load that each of those voices is bearing. So it works for that to divulge with energy a great deal of historical information. And it also works to sustain your belief that these things could really happen, which if, if we have the sort of the standard five character repertoire and they had all those different experiences of the occupation, you would probably not believe it as much. Um, so I think it was an excellent choice. I also think that Marianne didn't like writing dialogue very much. And you really get, you get off that hook with the epistolary novel. No, no, there is not much dialogue in an epistolary book. Yes, ma'am. I've noticed that that island is now on a lot of boat trips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know the difference between how often it was on those trips before the book? It has improved greatly. I am extremely popular in Guernsey. <laughs> they, oh, they're very proud. I mean, 
they, I think that last time I was there, I was there, they very kindly invited me to the, their first literary festival, and I gave a speech there, which was probably the most intimidating speech I've ever given in my life. But they, there were people who had, you know, corrections or ideas about things that weren't exactly correct. But they were, for the most part, they're, I swear it's as close to royalty as I will ever get. Walking down a street in Guernsey, I would walk down a street and there would be little clusters of people behind me going, that's it was wonderful. I figure, this is my career plan, this is my retirement plan. If this whole writing thing doesn't pan out, I'm going to go to Guernsey. I figure I can get a free drink for life in Guernsey. Kind of follow-up, has, has the air, has it changed a whole lot? Uh, last time I was there was in 2011 or 12. I think it was 11. And at that point, I had also been there in, in 2008 before the book came out, and it, I did not see change except there was a, a certain vitality in the air that could have been attributable to the, to the literary festival. But I'm going again next week, so ask me in a few more weeks. I, I, think, I think that um, it is quite a prosperous island for reasons that have nothing to do with the book. It's an offshore banking center. So they were not hurting in any way before this happened. I think they just are, they're more on the map now. They're more part of the sort of the cultural consciousness and I think that pleases them. Yes? Do you find it um, easy or difficult to go from an adult mindset to a child mindset and vice versa? That's a great question. Yes, I find it incredibly difficult. It's it's, I, I write for children, um, and my, I'm primarily known for the series Ivy and Bean, which is for seven-year-olds. And in the, the, the great difficulty of writing for children has to do with getting your brain to go into child mode. The great difficulty of writing for adults is, has, to, has to do with the actual writing. But the, the, the brain action is, it's so hard. I, there was a period where I was trying to meet two deadlines, and I was, so I was trying to do kid stuff and grown-up stuff in the same day. Like I was thinking, oh, I'll write the grown-up stuff in the morning and the kid stuff in the afternoon. Completely shorted my brain out. I, I wrote the worst, probably the, the worst pieces of those manuscripts at that time. I had to rewrite them all because I couldn't get there and I couldn't flop back and forth. Now I divide it up at the very least by weeks, but, but it's better if I do it by months. So I become a completely immature person for about a month and a half, and then I straighten up and think things through and write for adults. It's tricky. It's very tricky. Yes? I, too, love the Guernsey book and wondered, is there any chance that it would be turned into a movie? I think it would be great. Like, 84 Charing Crossroad, I love that movie. It's an old dashboard mm -hmm. that they have made a repeat, but and it's great theater, too. Yeah. Well, okay. Now, I'm not supposed to tell you guys this, but the, the, the book was optioned before it was published for a movie, for a film. And I was just with the producer last night, and I think things are looking really good. Okay, but this has been going on for years. And I don't understand Hollywood at all. I, what happens is that about every six months, I get a phone call from a parking lot in Los Angeles. And the person on the other end, and it's a number of different people, say, oh, we are making real progress here. And I say, that's fantastic. And then they hang up, and then I have, nothing seems to happen at all. So I don't know, but the producer seemed really positive. So the option prevents anybody else from developing it. That's right. That's, that's what that, that option is. I think it'd be great theater, too. Well, th yeah, that's possible. And there have been, they, they have very kindly, um, the people who optioned it, who have all theatrical rights, have very kindly um, made several exceptions for staged readings that have been very successful. Um, but nobody's done you know, a full production, which I think that they would not allow, especially because they're making such progress. I think. I don't know. I hope so, too. Yes? How did two women from West Virginia and California write a book? <laughs> How did we write this book about Guernsey? That's a very good question. And let's, we have to start with Marianne. Now, Marianne researched this book for 20 years. Um, Marianne, uh, 
this Marianne found, well, shall I tell you how Marianne found herself on Guernsey? Okay, this is kind of a complicated story. It's a very Marianne story. Marianne was in England doing research for another book entirely. She was writing a biography of uh, Lady Kathleen Scott, who was the wife of the polar explorer, uh, Captain Robert Falcon Scott. Um, Marianne loved him but there were lots of books on him. There were no books on his wife, so Marianne was writing a biography of his wife. She had gotten permission to go look at the family archive in Cambridge. And um, so she was there, it was very exciting. She was gonna do all this research. She was gonna write this biography of Lady Kathleen, big doings, she got to Cambridge, she went to the archive, she sat down, she started her research, and after three days she decided she hated Lady Kathleen Scott. <laughs> Terrible woman, didn't deserve a biography. So then, for reasons we, that we cannot fathom, we argue about this constantly, what on earth she was doing, she flew to Guernsey. And, and she had to have had a reason because you don't go there for no reason at all. It's, it's not on the way to anything. Um, so she, she flew into Guernsey. And, and then we go into a complete Marianne story. The moment the plane landed, a terrible fog boiled out of the sea enshrouding the island in gloom. The airport shut down, ferry service shut down, taxis went away, and there was Marianne in the airport for 36 hours, huddled under the hand dryer in the men's restroom. <laughs> the hand dryer in the women's restroom was broken. And but, so there she was, but Marianne was not a person who could go for 36 hours without having something to read, so every once in a while she went out and got herself a book from the, the bookstore at the Guernsey Airport, and all of the books that, that she read were about the occupation of the Channel Islands. Um, and now Marianne, being American, had no idea that the Nazis occupied those islands, and so she was completely riveted, completely fascinated. And when the fog finally lifted, uh, she left. She never saw the island, but she, she left. But she had, she had a whole stack of those books under her arm. She didn't steal them. She bought them. Um, and that started her off. And th that was in 1980. So she spent the next 20 years researching the occupation of the islands, but also resistance movements during World War II in general. And a lot, a lot, a lot about World War II history and military movements during the Second World War. But she didn't. She started writing the book in the year 2000. So from 1980 to 2000, it was research. That's how she got that that knowledge that allowed her to write the book. And and when I came along, I of course read all those books that she had hauled out of the Guernsey airport. But I also I did a lot of research on my own, you know, and then when all else failed, I made it up. <laughs> I only had a couple of months. I had five months. I had to get it. I had to, I had to learn it fast, and there are just some things you cannot find out without going to Guernsey, and I didn't have time to go to Guernsey, so I made it up. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? I wonder if the, uh, the fact that there was a small town in West Virginia, and Guernseyans, you know, kind of a small town, mm -hmm. that would have anything to do with the church. Oh, yes, completely. I mean, that to me, a small town is the perfect scene for all stories, because in a small town, in the small town that I grew up in, everybody knows something about everybody else. Okay, that's the great situation, because you know something, by reputation, maybe, only, but that's how stories begin. You know a piece, so you add another piece on, or you hear another piece, and you just you've got you've got it's all the riches of the world right there. That's it's it's like, as Jane Austen said. You know, the, my my delight. She said, my delight is a is a country village with three or four families, and I feel the same way. That is the the it seems to me like the richest uh, the richest. Uh, land in the world is a land with about seven or eight thousand people on it who are all know something about each other and this is this is treasure I think yes so is your mother still alive so that she could enjoy her sister's book being published and if so has she been to her 
my mother is still alive, and she did very much enjoy Marianne's book being published, and 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 also the fact that I had something to do with it too. The <laughs> pride was really filling the room there. Um, and she had not been to Guernsey; she couldn't go for the literary festival. But um, and I don't think Guernsey's not very easy to get to. I don't think she will be going. I wish she had, but I don't think she'll be going. Yes. Did you send it back in the 1930s so that you wouldn't hurt anybody's feelings now? I mean, you grew up on these stories, but families are really private when it comes to an outsider or somebody that wasn't involved in that actually telling the story. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the reason I said it in 1938. And I have to say that Everybody who's read the book who's in my family, well, except for one, um, thinks the book is about them. And they're very happy. They're very happy. But the reason I said it in 1938 is quite practical. I said it in 1938 because I needed that Federal Writers Project. That's how I was going to get my stranger into town. Um, and that's how I was going to get somebody who needed to look at the history of Macedonia. And the Federal Writers Project existed from 1935 to 1941, but their heyday was 38-39. And so that's how I picked the date. And I became fascinated with 1938. It's a fascinating period, but that was not, be, is not because of any prior love or and not because I was trying to protect anyone. It was just purely practical. I needed the writer's project. But it ended up being really interesting. Yes. Can you talk about um, Ivy and Bean a little bit? I'd love to talk about Ivy and Bean. Uh, Ivy and Bean, now, for those of you who don't know, Ivy and Bean, um, the, the, that's the name of the series of children's books I wrote, and the story is about two little girls who, before they met each other, did not like each other at all. Uh, Bean is the kind of kid who runs around and yells and screams, and Ivy's the kind of kid who reads big books, so they really don't have anything to do with each other until one day um, Bean is having some trouble with her older sister, and she decides that probably the best thing for her to do is run away from home, so she runs around her cul-de-sac and ends up talking to Ivy for the first time in her life. And during this conversation, she discovers that Ivy is um, practicing to be a witch when she grows up. And together, they decide that really let the permanent solution to Bean's problems with her older sister would be to cast a spell on the older sister to make her dance uncontrollably for the rest of her life. Um, and so they concoct this spell that consists primarily of worms. And um, it doesn't really turn out the way they had planned, but the older sister ends up covered with worms and mud and screaming. And so Ivy and Bean feel that this is an enormous success and that they are the best of friends for forever after that. And so your question is, where did I get that idea? Where did that, where did that all come from? Their characters. Well, I wrote the first Ivy and Bean book when there were a lot of seven-year-olds in my life and in my house and in my backyard and everywhere I went, I was surrounded by seven-year-olds. Now, my children think these books are all about them, but they're really taken from kids I knew. I mean, I was really concocting the, the characters from the kids I was hanging out with, I would see a kid do something, and I'd think, that is crazy. i got to have that in my book. And the, it, was, it was watching the kinds of things that they did and the kinds of things that interested them that made those stories happen. You know, and every, I still do that. I mean, I, I get a lot of credit for going around and talking to classes full of kids, and they all, every, all the teachers say, now, Miss Barrows is so nice to come and talk to us, but the real truth is that I'm just stealing shamelessly from what they're doing. You know, that's, I mean, it's research. Um, and I do think that little kids crack me up. The things that they do and say are so funny. And I think, you know, the, for instance, there's one Ivy and Bean book where um, there's a haunted bathroom at their school that is based entirely on a haunted janitor's closet at my kid's school. But janitor's Toilets are really hilarious, so I decided to make it a haunted bathroom. And, you know, I, I use events of my kids' lives, events of my life, even a couple of things my mom did for the books. So they're based, they're grounded in reality. <laughs> in the front, yes? Are there any children's authors that influence your writing, especially the IVD? 
Oh, yes, the Ivy and Bean books. I was heavily influenced. Um, but not, it's not very, I don't think it's very clear because I would say my biggest influence are the Betsy Tacey books, and those are very old books, and you can't really see it. The direct relationship isn't there, but those books were incredibly important to me as a kid, and that idea of friends who are not alike, but who complement each other, that was hugely influential to me. And also, I think that those books have that same respect for children that was really important to me. You know, I one of the most important elements to the Ivy and Beam is I mean, I mean, I, I am out to give kids a laugh, but one of the most important elements for me is the idea that kids don't need to be improved. They're fine the way they are. And that was apparent to me in, in the Betsy Tacey books too. And so that's an idea that I really I really love and I wanted to put in my books as well. You had a question in the back? Um, earlier you spoke about of switching between child and adult mm -hmm. perspective. So in The Truth, you've got Willa, and you've got the adult characters. So talk a little bit about that process. Well, I think that the a 12-year-old is a wonderful creature. Um, I think that I couldn't, I think it would be hard for me to write a book without a kid in it, for one. But I think that a 12-year-old is sort of at the at a point of brilliance that they're gonna lose, that they're about to lose it. And you don't get to, you, you, you get, you lose it for about 10 or 15 years after that. You're, you're lost, you're gone, you don't know what's going, you're, you're a mass of terrible confusion. Your ability to perceive things is trashed. So I didn't, I wanted to get her right there at that point. To me, a 12-year-old is a wonderful creature because most kids at 12, or most girls anyway, I don't know, guys are a mystery, um, have this experience where they suddenly realize that the grown-ups have not been telling them everything, that there's a grown-up world that is, has been shielded from them and that they don't know, and it's infuriating. And they, yet they still have that precision, that clarity of children and a clarity of, of their knowing what their emotions are. And that is so precious and it's, it's so um, delicate, it's so fragile. It, and it, by the time you're 14, you're such a mess, you don't know what's going on. So I think that, that I wanted to have somebody who could see, who could be filled with desire, filled with curiosity, see clearly, but doesn't know everything. And that to me is, that's a, that's a precious character and I had to have Willa in there to do that. She precipitates all sorts of shocking developments. Yes? Going from editing to writing, does that affect how you deal with editors? <laughs> I am so horrible. I, to edit me is like the worst job in the world. Yet the question is, does my career as an editor affect how I respond to editors? Oh, I'm just the worst. I, not so much with the big edits. I mean, the job of the, of the sub substantive editor is really to make the book the best of what it wants to be. And that's a sort of a, a metaphysical and philosophical position and there's there is some a great deal of argument about what it wants to be but I don't have a problem with those people but I'm horrible to the people who actually work on the line I mean I, I argue with everything I'm just completely passionate about semicolons and italics and I just I'm, I'm impossible and the, the, for this book the truth according to us oh, I had two editors who were line at who were doing the line with me and one of them Bless her heart, thought I was funny, thank God. And the other one, that poor girl. I think she's probably given up the entire career at this point. I argue with everything. I say, no, we can't have italics here. No, you can't put that quotation mark there. And I, because I was an editor, I know how arbitrary all of this is, that you, just, you, you establish a system and a style, and you just plonk it down on top of everything. And I don't buy it. I have very strong feelings about single quotations and italics. And, these important earth-shattering issues are, that's, I, I, I can't give up my position. No, so I think, I, I think it's just made me impossible. I think there should be a support group for everybody who has to copy edit me. They should all get together. Yes, ma'am. Following that question, um, did you have, do you have a problem in writing 
or does the editing take over while you're writing? Oh, the, for writing, I don't have a problem. I, I, I've, gotten, I've been doing this for 19 years now, and I, I feel that I've, I'm past the point of writer's block or procrastination. I really try to view it very straight, in a very straightforward, it's like, a, like I always try and think of myself as a plumber approaching a pipe. You know, I try to think of it pragmatically when I get there, and I try to sit down. I don't procrastinate anymore. And but I, my trick, my great trick as a writer, is to end each day um, someplace where I know what's going to happen next. And even if that means I end in the middle of a sentence because I know what the next word is, that means that I can walk in the next day and I know what I'm supposed to do. And that has been an enormous help for me to, to, to approach it and be able to sit down and just move in to the writing. But I also think that over the years, I've grown happier and happier while I'm writing. I like it. I like, the, I like to fix it. I like to make something where there wasn't anything before. To me, that's the most fascinating job in the world. So it's become better. E not, I wouldn't say easier, but better. So we have time for one or two more, if anybody has one or two more. Yes? I just started reading your book. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't remember the title. That's all right. I probably lose the title. That's okay. It's not, it's not as bad as Guernsey, but it's still long. Yeah. But I love the way, and I said it just begun, how you made Felix, whomever, whoever he is, so mysterious. Okay. I mean, is this to this person and this to the thing? Oh, good, good, good. I got her, I got her, I got her. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm glad you find him interesting. And I, I find him... Felix. Felix Romaine, I find him interesting as well. Yes, yeah, so I won't tell you anything. I won't tell you about the sh iceberg or the ship crashing into it. Or, yeah, no, no, I won't tell you any of that stuff. Well, I think we are done with the questions, and I think we can now proceed to the signing portion of the entertainment, which I believe takes place out that way, I hope. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>